do a lot of kids in youth orchestra go on to be professional musicians? And for me personally, the answer is, is it doesn't, to me, it doesn't really matter if they go on to be professional musicians. What's important is that they go on to be lovers of the art form. Yeah. And so yeah. whether they express that love through playing or becoming a patron, um, but it's really about, I talk about a lot when um, I'm referring to youth orchestras, it's, you know, it's teaching them music, but we're really teaching kids how to be more complete people. Now I can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> technology is great. I it's all <laughs> I, I'm, I'm blonde and technology, the two factors. Listen, I'm right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> Usually my son um, is around and then I call him and then he comes and sorts it out. But now he's not here. And now I've been to having for to yourself. sort out. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but I'm happy. It's so lovely to meet you here on Zoom. Likewise. Yeah, it's like, I'm, I'm so happy we could connect. Yeah. And, uh, well, I saw your appointment. So you ha had... Uh, appointment on at the um, what is it the abridged opera mm -hmm. yes yeah tell me more about that before i say the wrong no no it's it's okay thing. so i'm actually um i actually just got a new job so i i'm i'm now the assistant conductor of the jacksonville symphony and the music director of okay. the jacksonville symphony youth orchestras and so okay. prior to that uh, i lived in windsor ontario um, yeah. And I think you just recently did a, an interview with Robert Franz, the music director in Windsor. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I was the associate conductor of the Windsor Symphony as well. Um, you know, I was the conductor for Windsor Abridged Opera, which is an opera company that. Um, oh, I see. Hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah, it's an opera company that they do about two to three performances a year, depending on the year. And what's so fun and great about it, well, two things. One is that normally they do operas in. Um, different different types of settings, so non-traditional settings. So, you know, you'd normally think you go to an opera house and, you know, there's all of the stage and the lighting and the seating. Mm -hmm. um, they like to do operas, for example. We did Massenet Centurion in uh, a 1920s mansion in Windsor. And, oh. and so it was it was mm -hmm. opera in the round. So the, we had the orchestra in, in the corner of this, this giant um, living room. So the orchestra was in the corner. The audience was sitting in the living room, and Cinderella came down the stairs of the house oh, and wow. they, like dropped the dress down. So it was, you know, it's really it's, you're sort of like a fly on the wall watching, mm -hmm. you know, watching the story of Cinderella unfold as if you were in their house. Um, so that, of course, is incredibly exciting and new and different, especially as a conductor, because you know usually you're used to the singers are right in front of you, and in that scenario, you know, you're having to go over your shoulder a little bit to um, connect with the singers. The other thing that Abridged Opera does that was really great um, is we partnered with the Windsor Symphony Youth Orchestra and Community Orchestra, which I was leading at the time. Um, and we did uh, Mozart's Don Giovanni as a side-by-side -side with the professional musicians of the Windsor Symphony Orchestra. So we, we hired um, the principal strings uh, mm -hmm. of the Windsor Symphony, as well as Principal Winds, and then the youth and community orchestra members got to fill in the rest of the section, and they got to play an opera, and, you know, I remember wow. being in high school, and had someone said, hey, do you want to come play an opera, a Mozart opera? I would have said, great, but the opportunity wasn't there, so mm -hmm. it was really unique that way, and that we were able to provide uh, an opportunity to play a great masterwork um, to high school kids and community members that otherwise wouldn't have had that well, I find this wonderful because this is always this thing where you think when you are young and you are learning the instrument, um, if there's something that can just give you this incentive of what's ahead, you know, yeah. and if it's because I think there's sometimes this this very big gap between the between yes. the the first stages of of studying music and then you know the the final um or, or the the for where you are going and i wonder how many young people um stop music playing music because they, they just think it's not attainable or it's not or, or they just can't see where they're heading you know so this is a wonderful project that you're doing 
Yeah, uh, yeah, it was it was absolutely fantastic, and you know, it, I, I completely agree with you. Um, mm -hmm. Providing that experience for young musicians to see what it's like. So, a couple of things. One, um, having students sit next to professional musicians yeah. always changes something. I mean, sitting next to someone who has really dedicated their life to their instrument, um, the type of sound that students produce, especially watching string players, the type of sound that they produce when someone's next to them who's really, you know, really pulling the sound out of the instrument and they go, oh, that's how you do it, um, mm -hmm. is incredible. But, you know, I also find it, um, so, you know, thinking about, um, you know, that, that long trajectory that students mm -hmm. have. Um, when I was in Windsor, well, I did a, I had a junior youth orchestra. So these guys were, you know, eight to 12 ish age mm -hmm. range. And they, some of them had been playing for a little bit. Some of them were just starting. And part of what I did for them is I actually had them sit next to the high schoolers so they mm -hmm. could see the older kids, you know, the 17, 18 year olds. <clears throat> so they could at least see, you know, that next step for yeah. them. And then from there they saw, Oh, well, this is what professionals do. Mm -hmm. So really creating that, that arc there, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know what, we were, we were so fortunate because one, the Windsor Symphony is completely dedicated to, you know, providing those opportunities to students. And so is uh, the abridged opera. And so it was a, it was a perfect marrying and we had the right um, venue and the right um, resources at our disposal. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think both the kids walked away and also the professional musicians walked away saying, wow, that was really, really mm -hmm. incredible and something really cool. And, um, you know, we had plans to do, um, marriage of Figaro, but alas, COVID happened. And oh, okay. I had to go out the window. No. Well, um, also something you mentioned now that's, um, that I've actually heard before, but I just can't remember, but it was somebody now recently, a musician told me because they're doing a, a, a masterclass, but said that the, they don't, you they uh, they don't always communicate in words how the students should play but they play so that the student hears yes and now that you are saying this where where the the student you know the students sit next to the professional that they actually hear and get that feeling themselves you know yeah exactly mm -hmm. exactly um and you know, with string players too, because it's such a it's such a visual a visual performance, they can actually see how the physicality works. Um, for wind players, I'm a clarinet player. We spend a lot. It is really driven by that sound and, and like hearing, you know, mm. someone sitting next to you creating a sound that you never thought was possible. Um, I mean, I remember when I was when I was a young clarinet player, and it used to frustrate me so much because I would practice and practice and practice and practice. And then I'd go listen to a professional clarinet player and I, you know, I'd say, well, why don't I sound like that? Well, yeah. I never had the opportunity to actually sit next to one mm -hmm. and learn from them like that. So mm -hmm. um, a lot of my music uh, teaching now is, is uh, predicated on what I didn't have as a student, right? So providing yeah. that opportunity that I didn't have um, to just help students learn, really. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you made, you made a, a good point about you know, when, when students stop or if they stop playing. And, and I was asked this question recently with um, my appointment with the Jacksonville Symphony is, you know, do a lot of, do a lot of kids in youth orchestra go on to be professional musicians? And for me personally, the answer is, is it doesn't, to me, it doesn't really matter if they go on to be professional mm -hmm. musicians. What's important is that they go on to be lovers of the art form. Mm -hmm. And so whether they express that love through playing or becoming a patron, um, but it's really about, I talk about a lot when um, I'm referring to youth orchestras, it's, you know, it's teaching them music, but we're really teaching kids how to be more complete people, right? Mm -hmm. We're teaching them, we're teaching them emotional awareness, awareness of sound. We're teaching them all about historical context and a lot of, you know, a lot of social and political issues that come up in music. So it's really about creating a well-rounded human and music just happens to be the vehicle in which we, um, you know, the vehicle in which we use to do mm -hmm. that. Um, but the, you know, an, another great point to that too is that in a lot of communities, at least here in the States, there aren't a ton of opportunities sometimes for adults to get back into music. Um, and in, uh, in Canada, in Windsor, uh, there was a community orchestra that, that folded in 2015, just financial issues. And so part of what I did when I got to Windsor was I said, okay, 
well, let's restart this and bring it in as part of the symphony. So there's a little bit of a, you know, there's a protection there. It's, it's part of a larger organization. Um, and that way we can provide this experience for people who, you know, maybe they played when they were younger and then, you know, they went off to be a doctor and they just never, you know, they yeah. never had that opportunity to pick it up again. Mm -hmm. And the number of people that came to me and said, you know what, this is the best part of my week, just getting to sit down and make some music. I, you know, I spend all day, you know, in a courtroom or you know in a hospital and just being able to come here and express myself this way is really valuable to me so providing that opportunity too um i think is really important yeah and you have touched uh, such a great point there and this is something that i'm so passionate about and that is that children get the exposure to art and that i think for me it's it's exactly that you're saying is it's about the development it's about that um you know uh, having those skills of not just playing music but it's these these life skills of perseverance of being you know motivating yourself practicing all these things you know are so important and it's it's really now in during the pandemic that that i think this is what we should be thinking about not I think this is the the start of it it's uh, children have to understand music and art to understand the importance of it and yes I understand that what a medical doctor does is more important maybe that what a violinist does in in many circles but for me it's like this uh, um, art has a healing has a healing property and it's like you're saying now that people working and then it's that hour or those two hours that that they come and spend and do music is really what helps them to go back again and to do the work you know so yeah, I think, yeah. well no i was just going to say that but you mm. know I, I i completely agree and, and it's really um I always go back to it's it's about the shared human experience. All mm -hmm. art for me is about a shared human experience. Um, you know, I, I always used to say art and food, and I, I now consider food an art form. I mean, it, it is you yeah. know these yeah. master chefs yeah. that create these dishes. It's an it art is. form, um, but it's yeah. you know it's that thing that we as humans mm -hmm. all bond over, right? We all understand. You know, someone. You know, everyone understands. You know, let's take a big topic in art: death everyone at some point in their you know some point in their life has to grapple with this idea of death and life and what what is this you know what does this duality mean in our lives or heartbreak or you know maybe it's you know exuberant joy or anything like that you know that's that shared human experience and that's why i find it so powerful and as a tool too you know when i when i talk about um uh like education concerts that a professional symphony puts on a lot of what we talk about and you may have chatted with robert about this because he's a big advocate for it but this idea of active listening mm -hmm. and this idea that you know we're really trying to create an awareness in students of the sounds that they're hearing and how that can connect to everyday life um and you know here in the states especially one of the big big topics is that, you know, well, there's got to be a cross-curricular connection. You know, it can't just be music. It has to connect to literature. It has to connect mm -hmm. to math. It has to connect. And, you know, some people start pulling out their hair when you say, okay, well, how do I connect music to math or music to these other subjects? Mm -hmm. But when you go back to, A, it's a, it's a human experience, and you're really just creating awareness of sound, mm -hmm. all of a sudden music becomes a vehicle to learn about these other subjects, you know? Do you mm -hmm. take... Um, like the opening of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, you know, the really famous ba 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 ba. You can ask students to count how many times ba 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 happens in mm. you know in this short little phrase. It's thirteen, by the way. I believe it's thirteen. But no, I mean, really, yeah. The, yeah. this idea that you're you're really creating yeah. awareness of the world around you and the sounds that you're hearing and using that to create a more you know, a, a more um, aware and emotionally intelligent human. So that way, you know, it doesn't matter if they go and do something else. They have an appreciation exactly. for the art. Yeah. yeah, just because it makes them more human. Mm. Well, actually, um, uh, there's, um, there's a, a cellist who told me once that um, he started playing the cello because he's uh, somebody in a science experiment 
I use the cello to to um, explain vibration and and yeah, and that is how he started playing the cello. And if you think of it, ballet, uh, for example, the Cecchetti um, ballet movements mm -hmm. are all based on science. It's all scientifically yeah. um, figured out. So the the connection is there. It's just. I think a lot of people don't see it or don't don't understand it, you know. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And I and I think and I think again the the awareness and and really mm -hmm. the awareness is key. And for me, the the gateway to the awareness is creating a sense of active listening, like teaching people. I don't I don't think we spend enough time, you know, especially especially over um, over here, we spend a lot of time trying to break down walls because people have this notion about orchestras or symphonies that it is something that is you know, intellectually beyond them, right? Like that somehow classical music was not created for everyone. Um, and we, I think part of it too, is we don't, we don't spend enough time teaching people how to listen to the music. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, you know, I've, I've done this, I've done this uh, presentation tons of times, I, you know, and Robert's done it as well, um, about teaching people about active listening skills and what things you can listen for and just giving them tools so that when you're sitting in a, in a concert hall or you're listening to any performance, you can start to relate to it. You can start to understand it from a, from a more um, informed perspective. But it's not even a more informed perspective. You're really just making them aware of stuff they already know. Um, but it's that awareness that, that really is key. And, you know, if I'll, I'll share a little secret with you. I used to struggle very much as many people do listening to uh, atonal 20th century music i mm -hmm. used to struggle listening to it and, and i had the hardest time figuring out okay what is this and, and i knew it had value but mm -hmm. i couldn't um i couldn't get over that hurdle of like why do people like this what what about this is that you know do people like it i actually had a, a professor in, in when i was getting my master's um and her speciality was atonal 20th century music and she said you need to you need to let go of your preconceptions of what music is and just go back to the fundamentals of you know it's is it pitch no it's not pitch okay is it rhythm is it texture you know what what is the interaction between these instruments and let the harmony go and as soon as she told me that i went oh this music makes a whole lot more sense yeah. so yeah. even even someone who was you know i at that point was well into my my second degree in music still mm -hmm. needed someone to say here's here's this bit of awareness that you're you have those tools but you just need to become aware mm -hmm. of them and how to use them when you listen to this music mm -hmm. well this is uh interesting that you say that because i think this is and and this is why i do what i'm doing is that i um i think it's so important that we that we hear this that we learn from uh, artists you know that we learn because you you have a very great study of music and i mean still you have this idea even though you study music so can you imagine me uh, right. you know who who don't have a clue and and for me as i mean i also have my things like uh, uh, my children are ballet dancers and they mm -hmm. I, I have to develop a taste for contemporary dancing. Mm -hmm. And it's to this point that my daughter sometimes says to me, don't bother coming because you won't <laughs> like it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but interestingly enough, since I've been doing these interviews and speaking to um, dancers and, and being more aware of this, it changed my perspective completely, you know, right. and I think, yeah. Well, and, and, and again, you, you know, it's the same concept, but what, what, a, what, a, you know, what are the tools you have as a human yeah. to, to observe this, this ballet, right? And I think one of the big, big problems that we have, and it's really hard to do, and I'm definitely guilty of it, is that we try to assign a value judgment to a work of art before we allow the work of art to exist mm -hmm. right I mean, I mean within the first you know two or three minutes i i know because i've done this i go i don't like this and mm -hmm. as soon as you say i don't like this you you sort of you know you've removed the ability of the art to just exist 
rather than saying, you know, okay, how, how can I understand this piece of art from whatever perspective I have, you know, is it, yeah. you know, is it that it's rigid and angular? Is it that it's, you know, sort of fractured? And then, and then you have to remember that not all art is beautiful and not all art is, you know, made to be yeah. beautiful. Sometimes art is made to make us feel uncomfortable and unsettled. And maybe that's the point. Um, but yeah, having that awareness is key. And you're right, it, it translates to anything. Yeah. Well, um, now tell me about this new appointment of yours. You're going, you uh, have you started already? Are you? Yes, there? I've, I've already moved. And it was the, you know, normally these, normally the way that these um, auditions happen is usually you get, you know, it's usually like a two ish month process. So you've got a little mm -hmm. bit of time and then you know, it usually happens sometime in mid spring, and then you you move during the summer. Yeah. This audition, uh, I think, was posted for a week, and then mm -hmm. the the Monday after it closed, I got a call and said, "Hey, great, you know, you're one of the finalists. Please come to Jacksonville, um, and you need to be here next week." And I went, "Okay, well, <laughs> let me get a plane ticket." And so I got a plane ticket, yeah. and I came down. Um, and so the whole process really took about two to three weeks. Um, mm -hmm. which is really quite fast. And it was in June. Um, and so they offered me the job and I said, great. And then they said, when can you be here? And I said, I will have to see how fast I can get, <laughs> you know, I was moving from Canada all the way to Florida. I was like, oh, there's, there's a goodness. lot of moving parts. I have to cross an international border. Like it's, wow. it's going to be complicated. So um, my head is still spinning. I'm still unpacking every, every second I'm not working. I feel like I'm putting together a piece of furniture as, you know, as one does when they move. Um, yeah. So this, no, this are you, I, are you Canadian? No, I'm actually an American, and I, I was over in Canada working. I feel like an honorary Canadian um, because oh, okay. uh, when I got to Windsor, everyone there welcomed me with open arms, and you know they said, um, "Well, it was it was it was kind of funny because there's such a close connection between the United States and Canada." Um, but they had to teach me all of the Canadian isms, you know. So oh, okay. I. I I'm bringing a bit of Canada with me to Florida. I feel <laughs> I, think, I feel like an honorary Canadian. So, okay. um, so my new post in Jacksonville is very similar to what I was doing in Windsor. Um, in Windsor, I was you know conducting the professional orchestra with their uh, education, family concerts, um, some pops concerts here and there, some of the community outreach concerts, um, and then conducting their youth orchestras. So that's essentially the job I have in Jacksonville. So I'm the assistant conductor. Um, there are three conductors in Jacksonville. There's the music director, the associate conductor, and then uh, me, the assistant conductor. And so my profile, as I'm learning, I'm still learning more and more about this job, right? Like, I'm, I'm, it was so fast that I'm, I'm still getting integrated into the culture. But really, um, my focus as the assistant conductor is I do some, I do some of the pops concerts, um, and then I do all of the education concerts. And, and that's a really big, a really big... Um, part of my portfolio and part of why I believe they were really looking at me as this contender because I have such an education background um, and you know I spent time as a school teacher and so I've, I've kind of been on both sides of the equation mm -hmm. here um, and then on top of that so I actually have my position is divided into two so I'm the assistant conductor for the Jacksonville Symphony and then I'm the music director for the Jacksonville Symphony Youth Orchestra Program. And so the youth orchestras here, there are six ensembles. Um, there's usually about 200 kids that participate. Uh, and I conduct the top two uh, orchestras in there. So they're, they're both full orchestras. Um, and everything below there is a string orchestra. Um, so those are, those are sort of my, the two big pillars of my job. Um, and then sort of attached to both of those is a lot of community outreach and education and um, you know one of my um, big points is that orchestras are a cultural ambassador for the community that they're in and so it's really important for any orchestra to be engaging with the community as much as they possibly can and so as I've been planning with our education director you know we're planning a lot of how can we maximize me as a resource in connecting the orchestra with the community because again as you know sort of looping back to our whole conversation about you know making awareness creating awareness and, and yeah. building, you know breaking down those walls the best way to do that is to engage and a lot of times it, it really um, is better for me to go to them so if I'm going to a school or I'm going to a community center even if I'm not bringing an orchestra with me 
Um, yeah. Just being able to have that conversation and, and get people thinking about it and, and really sort of removing one brick at a time out of that wall. Um, and so that's really sort of my, my profile here in Jacksonville. Well, I'm I'm going to uh, have to have a lot of more conversations with you because you are my man. I love <laughs> this, whole, <laughs> this whole education thing for me is so important. I think really this is, you know, this is the 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 thing that that needs to be done and. Especially, I mean, during lockdown, I spoke to a lot of musicians in America and about the situation that you have there. And uh, it, you don't have it as as easy as as the, no. uh, the artists in, in Europe, for example. And I mean, I've been speaking to artists in South Africa and, and uh, Sunday I spoke to um, a composer in Nigeria. And mm -hmm. I mean, there it is, it's, it's just different. Worse. Right? It's yeah. it's worse, really. But I think from that uh, um, outlook that you have, from let's get the community together with the music, with the you know, this is how parents then start seeing also the importance of art education for their children, um, and um, that we break away from this this idea that only when you do maths and science it's important you know so yeah. um mm. well and you know it, it going to the you know how how orchestras and how artists have wow. have coped during this time um mm. you know we i i as i normally do i was told you know when, when we locked down and we were planning for we were planning for a digital season in winter right so we were going to record everything and then release it and then sell access to those recordings um you know i was asked okay so what are you going to do for education because you can't go into the schools. So what is that going to look like? And for me, you know, as an educator myself, I, I have a real um, strong attachment to the experiencing art in person, like listening to, I mean, you can, you can probably attest to this, you know, watching ballet on a mm. screen is great, but being there and physically yeah. seeing them and being in the environment is really also part of the experience. So mm. I had to grapple with, okay, so how do I make up for that? So what I did was I actually created a digital education concert series with the Windsor Symphony. And it was 12 hours of um, music curriculum that we sent to the classroom. So it was performances with the Windsor Symphony. And what I did was is, um, I tailored it to two different topics. So one of them, we had a, K, a, a kindergarten through grade three. Um, and that one we called adding up the orchestra. And so what we did is we talked about different ways that composers can add musicians together or add sounds together, you know, uh, loud, quiet, um, high, low, long, short, all of that stuff. Um, and so I would talk about that and then there would be a performance that would represent that. The really interesting and fun thing that happened was is that in the process of this, um, one, I learned a lot about video editing that I never thought I would be able to, you know what I mean? Like if you ask me yeah. in music school, are you going to figure out how to use Premiere Pro and, and Photoshop? I'd say, no, I, I'm going to look at this Brahms symphony, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, I figured out how to, how to edit fairly mm. decently. I don't consider myself a, you know, a Hollywood pro, but enough that, yeah. that I can make something compelling. And so what I was able to do, two things. One, I was able to take a, um, a spectrogram. And a spectrogram mm -hmm. is something that, you know, it maps the sounds that it sees. It's sort of like um, a, top, a topographic map, right? When you look at a map and it's actually got the mountains and all the valleys and stuff in mm -hmm. it. It's like that, but for sound. And so I took the recordings of the Windsor Symphony and I plugged it into this spectrogram and it, and it spat mm -hmm. out this sort of Amazing. in real time and so I put yeah. that like a little crawler on the bottom of the performance wow. so the kids yeah. got to watch the sound as it as it went through I also had them, I had them uh everything I compared because it was it was it was numeracy based so it was math based but yeah. everything connected also to art so mm. um you know if we were adding musicians together I had a painting on there like a Kandinsky mm. painting and I would deconstruct the painting with the music and then reconstruct it with the music wow. side by side so the kids yeah. could see that oh 
what they're doing over here and like all art is the same in, in terms of its expression. What, what yeah. Kandinsky is doing over here with these circles is the same thing that's happening over here. It's just mm -hmm. that how they're accomplishing that goal is different. Yeah. So that was the K through three. Our four to six was creating an orchestral fairy tale. Um, mm -hmm. And so the way that that one worked is that we talked about the four sort of fundamental elements of telling a good story, which is, you know, when you talk about the most basic elements, you're talking about setting characters, conflict and resolution. And mm -hmm. that just happens to be pretty much any, you know, classical form mm -hmm. that we talk about kind of fits that story model. So um, students, uh, you know, I think they're, I gave them a piece, I gave them uh, the Overture to the Barber of Seville. Mm -hmm. And so for each section of that piece, they had to write part of their orchestral fairy tale. So the slow introduction, that was their setting. And then, you know, ba 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 bottom, ba ba bottom, that was character one. And then ba 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 dee dum, ba dum, ba dum, ba dum, that was character two. And they had to talk about how they were different because they're very different characters. And so they had to talk about that. And we talked about the conflict that happens and then the resolution. Ba 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 And the stories that these kids came up with were A, hysterical, but they were also incredible. Um, yeah. and, and it's not just, and you know, it wasn't just that it was free creative writing, it was structured mm -hmm. writing, right? They mm -hmm. weren't just saying, okay, here's a piece of music and write whatever you feel, which is valid and great. But this had a little more, you know, here are the parts mm -hmm. to telling a real story and then glue them together to create a, you know, that cohesive um, mm -hmm. narrative. And so uh, but with both of those programs and each of them got a, a live or a digital Q&A mm -hmm. with me and a teacher professional development session. And I think we reached 122,000 students across Canada and the U.S. I Amazing. mean, it, because it was digital, we just, mm -hmm. you know, as many people as would listen to us, um, you know, yeah. I felt a little also like a walking, talking salesman at the number of meetings really? I had with, you know, yeah. district coordinators and and saying, hey, yeah. look, here's this great program. You should definitely purchase it yeah. because of all of these things. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we, we got up to 120, I think it was 120 to 550, I think was the actual number we got to. Yeah. And again, we had no idea it was going to explode that way. We, mm -hmm. we were really just focusing on our district. And then we thought, well, it's digital. So why don't we try to help yeah. as many teachers and students as we can now? Yeah. Um, and and will, you, will you continue this program? Yeah, so the program, yeah, so part of, so I'm, I'm in Jacksonville now, but yeah. um, because my hiring would happen so quickly in, in mm -hmm. uh, with Jacksonville, and because of the health restrictions in Windsor, they yeah. really can't find a, a replacement right now for me, and so mm -hmm. um, in Windsor, what they're doing is that they have a, um, a few very qualified people who are going to take over the youth orchestra and community orchestra programs. Yeah. And then I will be coming back to do their family concerts and their education series. Um, and as okay. part of that education series, we're going to one, um, we're, we're going to continue to sell the program that we did create. Um, yeah. And part of that also is because of the, um, a, the generosity of, of our musicians and the musicians union mm -hmm. there, allowing that to happen and, and allowing us to do that in a in a way that's affordable and still impactful. Yeah. Um, so we'll continue that. And then the idea is that we're gonna add, we're gonna add lessons to it essentially. Mm -hmm. So this next year we'll film the the concerts that we would that we'll do in, in sort of a normal education setting, and then we'll add two, two episodes to that. Um, yeah. list of list of episodes that we have so we'll build it so how do uh, is, is this now for schools or is this for for anybody to to be able to access sure so um we normally sell it to a school district but i do believe no. that there is an option if you're interested okay. i think it's just slightly more i think it's like 25 dollars more expensive so i think it's about 125 dollars oh, okay. for the whole program but if you mm -hmm. as an individual wanted to purchase it you can. I think we have that option. Mm. So. Because this would be something great to to just um, put out there, you know, for people who would be interested. And, you know, especially um, schools, or, or not, not just schools, but but parents who do you think it's something that you can, as oh, a parent? Oh, absolutely. Can, how is yeah, it? I mean, the, the, so a couple of things. One is that our target audience was actually um, uh, non-music specialist teachers. So yeah. a lot of times, um, it's just it's just how education systems are set up in different places. A lot of mm -hmm. times, the person teaching music might not be 
a, a music specialist, right? Like they might yeah. not have gone to school to do that. And they just happened to get a job where they said, hey, look, this is part of your portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of that is that we wanted to gear that towards them because there is nothing more terrifying than being asked to teach something that you feel like you're not fully yeah. prepared to teach. So it was, we created it so it was user-friendly that way. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, if you had a parent who just wanted to, you know, sort of go through the program with their kid, it's, it's geared towards someone who, you know, you don't have to have a music degree to understand mm -hmm. the program and use it for sure. Yeah. Well, that's great. I think, um, yeah, I would, I would, if you can send me more information, I will put this in the description of this video, because I think if, if somebody was interested to, uh, to do that, this is very, very, a, a very a lovely project. Yeah. And you know, it's a great way to, um, it's a great way to introduce kids to classical yeah. music, but also to understand that classical music doesn't exist in a silo. It mm. really, it, it really is connected to all art. Um, exactly. And that, that, I think, is the beautiful part about it, for sure. Yeah. But um, so now uh, you, this, the youth orchestras that you work with there in Jacksonville, um, what is the plan? What is your program like this year? Yeah, so um, it's a little bit of a question right now. We're, we're still sorting through some of the... Um, safety protocols and precautions. Oh, of course, yeah. Um, yeah. Like, I mean, as as every arts organization, you know, it, we I always say we keep pivoting to meet the reality <laughs> yeah. of this of the health situation. Yeah. Um, so for now, our, our goal is to be back in person um, mm -hmm. with safety precautions. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's our that's our working goal right now is that we really want to be back in person and yeah. um, making music in person. In terms mm -hmm. of you know what type of repertoire we're going to do, I still have to wait for a few more auditions to come in. But I'm a big fan of um, I like French opera overtures and it, it, they they oh, are um, yeah well you know I like them for a couple of reasons. One yeah. is they they require a large orchestra, yeah. but they're the way that they're written they a lot of times um, double parts. And so mm -hmm. stuff is well covered. So if you happen to be missing an instrument, so for example, um, most if you ask most uh, youth orchestra programs in the States, what instruments are you missing? They'll probably say, we have no oboes and no bassoons. It's just the it's just the sort of reality of, of mm -hmm. where it's, it's an instrument that is mystical over here. And I'm not sure why, but it is. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, programming something like that that's thick, we call it thickly scored, um, mm -hmm. it, it, uh, it um, allows us to still perform it even if we're missing a bassoon or missing an oh, oboe. Okay. So yeah. we're not, you know, you know, there's not some big bassoon solo in there and that, you know, we yeah. can't do the piece. So, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and you make the decision on what, what would be the, the repertoire? Yeah, so I'll, I make the decisions on repertoire and on seating. Mm -hmm. So, um, as I again, as I was like unpack, unpacking boxes, boxes, excuse me, and putting together furniture, I was also listening to auditions for all of the students in the youth orchestra and seating oh, them. Okay. Yeah. Um, my predecessor left me notes, which I'm very, very grateful for. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, I had to, I had to seat them, and then we sent out the seating, and and then we have to. We're we're now in the process of starting to prepare that music. So that means that you know we've got things we got to get things bowed, make sure all the bows are going the same direction. Um, and then students know where they're sitting on each piece. So for the winds, especially in youth orchestras, um, because we like to, um, it's really about participation and encouraging the experience. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we'll have the winds um, swap seatings during oh, different, different pieces, right? So on this piece, you'll play first. On this piece, you'll play second. And so they get mm -hmm. that. It's a more, um, it's a more well-rounded experience that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I would, I would love to, um, when you are, when you get going and, and so, um, speak to you again. And because I think your work is amazing. Oh, I'm so you. excited. I'm so happy that I, that we uh, got to connect. Um, because, uh, because yeah, like I say, the, the, the programs for, for children and for young students, I think is very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it was, it was lovely connecting with you too. I mean, it's, I, 
you will you will find I will always talk about music education. I can talk about music education really for days for days. I mean, I just <laughs> it's just something. It's a labor of love for me. It's a passion mm -hmm. I have. Um, you know, being uh, being a professional musician, I feel like for me, I have that um, um, responsibility, mm -hmm. right? Being to pass that on to really help educate people, not mm -hmm. only those who are interested in in honing their skills on their instruments but also those people who just, you know, fostering a sense of love for the art form and for all art yeah. form. And mm -hmm. because it creates, you know, more well-rounded humans. That to me, I think having that as the goal, you know, and it really, um, it really helps drive this forward and really makes me more passionate about it. You know, I'm, I'm building better people and that's, yeah. that's always yeah. something great and what, what this world needs more of for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And I think it's, it's uh, you know, it's a pity that, the, and, and this is something that I've heard and I've raised the question many times in, in my interviews, like, um, you know, what about art education? And everybody is saying things like, well, the schools are cutting down on art and, and that's the first cut, you know, or it's like art uh, lessons are not being taken seriously and it's always something on the side. And somehow I think it, it should be changed and, and it can be changed, you know, and, um, and I think this pandemic, if, if there's one thing that we have to take from this pandemic is that we understand the value of art because mm -hmm. there was not one person who did not use in some form of art. Uh, and, and like you say, even cooking is a form and baking is a form of art. Yes. Um, and All that those we sourdough started. To. Yeah, I mean, people started knitting and doing sewing and baking and cooking. So it's in our nature and it's in us to, the, the moment things are uh, quiet or the moment we are in, in situations like this, that uh, it just shows that we revert back to this natural instinct of, in us to, to create, you know? And um, so I think this, this would be my, my wish that, uh, my wish is really that every child um, has the possibility either to play an instrument or to dance or to do, you know, a, a visual art or something, uh, because I think it would make society also uh, such a much better uh, or, or, you know, people will be much more at ease and peace with themselves if they can, uh, if they can create and be creative. Well, and, and again, yeah. to your point, you can also understand someone who doesn't look like you, think like you, you know what I mean? Like yeah. art really opens yeah. our eyes to, you know, again, that shared human experience that someone who yeah. it comes from a different part of the world and you don't understand anything about them. Yeah. Except the shared human experience. And then all of a sudden you're humanizing someone. And as soon as you start humanizing someone, the world becomes a better place. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So Daniel, have a lovely, um, where are we now? And you're still in morning. In, oh, no, not in yeah, morning. It's, you're it's, still in the morning. Yeah, it's still morning here. <laughs> <laughs> I've got coffee. I've got coffee. I'm sure you're, you're ready for <laughs> <laughs> But we'll all speak right. soon. Okay. Bye. Have a great